morning. My name is Carter Presbyterian Church. I am a co-adult. I am your elder of the week, and my contact information is in the bulletin. Please let me know if I can help. Uh, we have two announcements for me to do, and one additional announcement that I'm aware of. So the first announcement is Denny asked me on behalf of Building and Grounds to thank everyone who came out to work yesterday in the yard. It looks lovely. So thank you to all of you who did that. Um, the second thing is we will continue to take up an offering in addition to asking for continued prayers for the people of Ukraine. The offering is for um, Presbyterian Disaster Assistance. You can see the announcement in your bulletin. Please consider in addition to your prayers to um, make a donation um, on behalf of that. Um, and you can mark your check for PDA. Okay. And then Christy has an announcement for the Walk for Water. clean or safe. Water Mission is working to change that, and this year our church is going to be helping to bring awareness and raise funds for their work. There will be an information table during fellowship today where you can find out more about Water Mission and the amazing work that they do, and also about how you can be a part of that work. Walking is not the only way to participate. Please stop by the mortar mission table before you leave today and join in helping to bring safe water to the 2.2 billion people who still suffer under the global water crisis. Thank you.
And Joel, too, the prophet, calls to the people of God. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to aim, and abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. Friends, on this first Sunday of Lent, let us return to the Lord with all our hearts, trusting in the faithfulness of God to forgive. Join with me in the responsive prayer of confession found in your bulletin and in the silent time that follows. Let us confess our sins privately before the Lord. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, cleanse me from my sin. I know my transgressions, my sin is ever before me. Against you, you alone, have I sinned, and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless when you pass judgment. You desire truth in the inward being, therefore teach me my wisdom and my secret heart. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain in me a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O God, will not despise. Hear this word of good news from Hebrews 8. This is the covenant I will establish, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. The good news of the gospel is that we are forgiven, not because of our own worthiness, but because God forgive, forgives and redeems us day by day, granting us new hearts that desire to follow him. Believe the good news of the gospel. We have confessed our sins, and our sins are forgiven. Thank be to God. Thank you. that it's 
second and stay a little bit back. What is this? Not a bagel. It's bread. That's right. Now, do you know what? It's just ordinary bread, right? And then in here, in here, there's some juice. Yeah. And do you know that even though this is just ordinary bread and ordinary juice, in just a little while during worship, we are going to break this bread and pour the juice, and it is going to become for us holy communion. It is going to remind us of Jesus' body and remind us of Jesus' blood. And as we share it, the Holy Spirit is here with us, and we are sharing a sacrament of God. Now, that is, don't touch it. <laughs> so, this meal, it's just ordinary things, but when we use them for a divine purpose, they are holy. All right, can you sit back down over here? Now, what about each of you? Do you think you're holy? No. Mm. <laughs> Let us pray. O oh God, your word is more precious than fine gold and sweeter than purest honey. As we turn to your scripture, send your Holy Spirit to infuse your word with truth and grace, so that the good news of your love would shine before our eyes and delight our senses, so that we cannot help but respond with wonder, faith, and trust. Amen. Please stand with me for the reading of God's Word. Our first scripture lesson for today is 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 8 through 13. You can find it on page 375 in the front portion of your pew Bible. Listen to God's Word for you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call on His name. Make known His deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all his wonderful works. Glory in his holy name, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength, seek his presence continually. Remember the wonderful works he has done, his miracles and the judgments he uttered. O offspring of his servant Israel, children of Jacob, his chosen ones. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Please be seated.
These words remind us that when we pray, we are at the same time calling on the creator of all the cosmos who is in heaven, who invites us to approach his throne with the Hebrew term of endearment, Abba, or Dad. And so God is bigger and stronger than our minds can begin to ever comprehend. But at the same time, God is intimately acquainted with us the same way that loving mothers and fathers care for their precious children. God invites us to come and to spend time with him in prayer. You see, our all-knowing Abba knows what we need before we think to ask. And so when we pray, we do so with confidence because God is welcoming us. God hears our prayers. God knows what we need, and God desires to give us that that we need. And so today, as we start our journey with on Sundays, we are going to look at the first petition of the prayer. Hallowed be thy name. Now, there's a lot of cultural distance between us and these four little words. There's a joke that says that once there was a little child who told her dad, Oh, dad, I know God's name. And he said, Really? What's God's name? Well, it's Harold. Because when we pray, we pray, Our Father who art in heaven, Harold be thy name. It could be Harold. Not only is there that distance between us in that old English of the King James Version that we recite in our congregation when we pray the Lord's Prayer, but there's also a lot of distance between us in that culture in which Jesus first prayed it. And so today's lesson taken from the prophet Ezekiel, it provides us with great insights into those four little words so that we can understand as modern Christians that when we pray, hallowed be thy name, we aren't simply making a statement about the nature of God's name. We aren't saying his name is Harold. Instead, we are praying that God will make God's name hallowed on earth. And we are offering ourselves as the instruments that God can use to do so. Now, in the Bible, the idea of God's name refers to much more than what one might write on a name tag. It's not just, hello, my name is God, right? God's name is God's reputation among the nations. If you go all the way back in your Bible and turn to Genesis 12, you'll find the story of when God called Abram, and the beginning of the covenant that God made with God's people. And so God calls Abram out of the blue to leave everything he knew, all of his family, and to go into a place that was unknown, that God was going to give to Abram and Sarai. And in that place, God was going to become their God, and they would be his people. He would make a great nation out of these two very old people with no children. God promised Abram that all the families of the earth were going to be blessed through him. And then after Abram died, God renewed that covenant. You'll remember he renewed it with Abraham's son, Isaac, and then again with Jacob, who would be named Israel. And in the covenant that God made with those patriarchs, God promised he's going to set the people of Israel apart. They are going to be his people. And he's going to give them that land of Canaan as their inheritance. They were God's people. He was their God. They were set apart by God to carry God's name and to be a blessing to the nations. So if you fast forward a couple, about 400 years, right, from the time of Joseph, the Israelites are where? In Egypt. That's right. They're in Egypt where in the time of Moses, God renews that covenant. So Joseph came. He went to Egypt. They stayed. They became slaves. They cry out. And God says, I've heard my people's cry. He renews his covenant through Moses. So Moses goes up and meets with God on Mount Sinai to receive 
the law. This is the next gift of the covenant. It's what was going to govern the people as God was their king. But just, if you think we have printer problems at Yeamans Park Presbyterian Church, there were no printers in those days. And so God was taking God's sweet time on the mountain, and the people got impatient. That never happens to us, does it? No. And so, since God was taking such a long time, they told Aaron, give us a new God. Give us something new. And so Aaron takes their gold, and puts it in the fire, and boop! Out pops a golden calf. And he says, oh, Israel, these, this is your God. This is the one who led you out of slavery. The people wanted a God that they could see, a God they could feel. Perhaps the people wanted a God they could control. At any rate, Aaron made them that golden calf, and God was not pleased. He told the people that it was this calf that had delivered them from bondage. God was so angry with Aaron and the Israelites that he tells Moses to step aside because he is going to obliterate the people and start over with Moses. And Moses reasoned with God. One of my favorite stories in the Bible to challenge your faith. Moses said to God, Lord... Why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say it was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath, Lord. Change your mind and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, how you swore to them by your own self, saying, I will multiply your descendants like the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have promised I will give to your descendants, and it shall be theirs forever. And then the Bible says, and the Lord changed his mind about the disaster that he had planned to bring on his people. Friends, God relented from pouring out his wrath on Aaron and the Israelites that day, not because they deserved it, but because God knew that God's name was on the line. Later, in the days of Samuel, the people rejected God again as their king. They asked for a human king like all the other nations. It seems that they couldn't get it out of their system. They still really wanted someone they could see and they could feel. And even though God warned them that if you get a human king, he's going to take away all your freedoms, they chose security and familiarity. And so God blessed them. And when David came to the throne, God made the third covenant, the covenant of a king, who would sit on that throne as long as the king followed in God's ways. And throughout the history of Israel, God continued to set the Israelites apart. They were the people who were chosen to bring God's name into the world. They were the ones. God made his covenants with them. He would give them the land, the law, and the king. But when we get to Ezekiel's time in today's lesson, the Israelites had lost all three. You see, God allowed the people to lose their land as they were carried off into exile from their violence and their idolatry that they would not turn from. And then when they were in exile, they didn't get the memo and they still didn't follow God's law. They were under the rule of a foreign king and a king never sat on that throne until Jesus came again. And so as God speaks today, we see that in the same way that God changed God's mind about destroying the Israelites in Moses' day, God is still very much concerned about the reputation of God's name among the, Israel, among the nations. In verse 20, right before today's reading, God says, But when they came to the nations, wherever they came, they profaned my holy name. In that it was said of them, these are the people of the Lord? 
and yet they had to go out of his land? But I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations to which it came. So this story reminds me of those times, maybe parents among us might can relate a little bit. When my children do something that we'll say is less than wonderful, just a little less than. And so I call Jason and what do I say? I say, let me tell you what your child did today. <laughs> because at that time, it's not my name that's on the line, it's his, right? None of us likes to be embarrassed by the people who bear our name out in the world. To be holy is to be set apart for a divine purpose. To be hallowed, not herald, is to be considered holy. And so if you go all the way back to God's covenant with Abraham, you'll recall that the reason God set them apart in the first place was so that they could be a blessing to all the nations. But by the time we get to, the Eze to Ezekiel, the people of God were anything but holy. As the ones who were set apart to carry God's name into the world, instead they were known for their violence and their idolatry. They did not cause God's name to be hallowed. The nations knew that Israel was the people of God, and they also knew that Israel was not following God's name. And so God says that when they lived in violence and idolatry, God was still not done with them. God was going to make God's name hallowed among the nations. God, God's self, would sanctify God's holy name. But God chooses to still use those Israelites that can't get it right and so speaking through the prophet, God makes a promise to Israel. He says, I am going to gather you in. I'm going to restore that land that I promised to you. God is going to cleanse them from their sins and give them a new spirit and a new heart. And instead of those hearts of stone, he would replace them with hearts of flesh that could be penetrated by the love of God. God promised that God was going to give the Holy Spirit to live in their hearts that would transform them to the point where they actually desired to do God's will. God was going to restore the law by writing it on their hearts. And then once again, God promises, you shall be my people and I will be your God. This is how God will hallow God's name among the nations. This is the new covenant that God promised to God's people. This is the new covenant that we believe as Christians was fulfilled when Jesus came to cleanse us from our sins. And then when God sent the Holy Spirit to live in our hearts, transforming them from hearts of stone to hearts of flesh. The Holy Spirit lives in us, and it grants us the desire to do God's will. So when Jesus taught us to pray, hallowed be thy name, he wasn't simply saying, holy is your name. Ezekiel showed us God already knows God's name is holy. We're the ones that don't get it right, correct? When we pray these words, we are asking God to make the holiness of God's name known in the earth. And then we're offering that God can use us to do so. The good news of the new covenant is that we are just as incapable of doing this on our own as the Israelites were. Right? They messed up again and again and we are going to mess it up too. And knowing this, God is the one who comes to make God's name known through us. God is the one who transforms our hearts. God is the one who puts his spirit in us, giving us hearts that are no longer made of stone, but hearts that beat to do God's will. Now I have a friend who is an honorably retired Presbyterian pastor, and he once told me that he wears a clerical, or he wore a clerical collar while out in public 
not to let other people know that he was a pastor, but because he himself needed that physical reminder of who he was as a pastor. You see, although his hair is quite white these days, he once was a fiery redhead, and I married one of those, and they might need a little extra help sometimes when they're out in the world, right? And so that collar did that for him. Now, we may not wear a collar that tells others that we belong to Christ, but each of us bears Christ's holy name as we go out into the world each day. And so what is it going to look like for God to use us to hallow God's holy name? I don't think it's going to look like God setting us apart on a special shelf as holy where we won't get dirty in the world. Instead, I imagine it will look much more like getting dirty, turning over the tables of oppression and corruption, taking up a towel so that we might serve a person in need, or even carrying a cross of self-denial, because this is what Jesus did. And this is what following in Jesus' footsteps looks like. God uses us to make God's name known among the nations. When we have those hearts of flesh that are willing to follow God's ways, when we are willing to follow the way, Jesus Christ, hallowed be the name of our God. And may we be the ones that God uses so that it will be so. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>
Please pray with me. As this bread is Christ's body for us, send us from this table to be the body of Christ in all the world until we come at last to the one table of your kingdom to feast with you and all your saints in the joy of your eternal realm. Amen. Friends, we now come to the time of worship where we are invited to respond to the gifts of grace that we have received with our own gifts to the Lord's work. I invite you to give generously as the Lord has given to you.
God, we offer you these gifts. We offer you our lives. Sustain us by your grace and multiply these gifts for the glory of your holy name as we carry it out into the world. For Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.